Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Gordon Carpenter. I'm the, uh, yeah, kids, you can go to the fun service now. Man, you really know how to make a guy feel welcome. Stand up and half your congregation leaves. Um, my name is Gordon Carpenter. I'm the youth director here at Horizon. It's my privilege this morning to bring you guys God's word from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, you might be tempted to think uh, that by my red and black, I like Georgia. But just like Ben's story, I hate Georgia. Um, I also prayed for Carolina yesterday. I am a Carolina fan. Uh, Max Dotson, I do love you, though. And your jersey is cool. Um, <laughs> the past couple weeks, uh, our head pastor has been away on vacation, so we've had pulpit supply by two men that are very near and dear to me. Jeff Heiser was one of them. I grew up with Jeff here at Horizon, and Jim Stevenson was our founding pastor and was my pastor for most of my life growing up. But this morning, it is my privilege to return us to our regularly scheduled program in a sermon series going through 1 Samuel 17. So if you have your copies of God's Word, uh, please turn there. Now, it's my custom uh, to have you stand for the reading of God's Word before I preach. However, it's like 50-something verses, and for the sake of time, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. Um, as we go, I will just read chunks of Scripture to you, and then I'm going to explain some key points from each chunk and each portion of Scripture. Does that make sense? You guys with me? All right. Before we begin, uh, would you pray with me? And hopefully your prayers will be more effective than mine were for Carolina. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you're sovereign over us. Thank you that you will receive glory no matter what. And God, as we spend a few moments this morning looking at this chapter of Scripture, I know that the words that will come out of my mouth have been preordained. So give me confidence to speak boldly. Give my hearers ears to listen and hearts to understand. And Throughout this entire process, Heavenly Father, I ask that you help me make much of your Son and that you receive the glory from everything this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, uh, if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, or if you know your Bible super well, or uh, maybe if you read the heading above 1 Samuel 17, you know the story that we're going to be talking about this morning. It's perhaps the most famous story in all the Old Testament. It's David versus Goliath. Many idioms have been birthed from this story, and every single one of you, if you grew up in Sunday school, had this story taught to you. And this is how it was taught to you, more likely than not. David was a brave boy, so God gave him strength to defeat his Goliath. If I'm a brave boy, God's going to give me strength to defeat my Goliath. So the moral of this story is, I'm David, I'm going to be brave, I'm going to defeat my Goliaths. Um, I don't mean to discount your Sunday school teachers if that is how you have been taught this story, um, but that is an abysmal takeaway from David versus Goliath. And it's not unique to Sunday school teachers. Believe it or not, I spent a long time this week in preparation for this, reading sermon after sermon after article after article, spanning Christendom. And all of them had the same thrust. My favorite begins this way. Today's life's circumstances, personally in our families and nationally, the Goliaths of our time are speaking in the same mocking tone, trying to intimidate us so we cower in fear, discouragement, and confusion. The antidote lies in cooperating with God and those five smooth stones. The five smooth stones represent preparation time David had with God, learning to listen and trust and obey and, again, cooperate in faith. I think the five smooth stones represent the holy habits that God asks us to develop for life's battles and to strengthen and encourage one another as we face our Goliaths. The five holy habits are prayer, sacred scripture, the Eucharist, monthly confession, and fasting. These five smooth stones require a lifetime of practice, 
but with them you can defeat the Goliaths of your life. This comes from a Roman brother, and uh, don't worry, we'll talk about everyone. It's not just Rome that gets this wrong. But that is the theme, right? We tend to take Old Testament narrative, boil it down to Aesop's fable, a moralistic tale. We place ourselves in the center. We're the hero. So if I act like the hero, my results will be the same. Daniel in the lion's den. I'm just going to jump into the zoo in a, in, a, in a pit full of hungry lions, having faith in God. Try that. You, you'll make the news. Shout out Harambe. Okay? Uh, I've said this before. The Bible's not about you. You're not the main character. So what is a better way to read this narrative? I present the main point of this message. Let's dive in, shall we? Uh, we have to start with the problem. Uh, and contextually speaking, the problem, the overarching problem is this. Israel, up until this point, like two minutes ago in Israelite history, uh, I've said this before, Israel was a theocracy, meaning God was their king. All throughout uh, the land, uh, all throughout leaving uh, Egypt, all throughout the wandering, uh, wandering in the wilderness, all throughout uh, taking over the promised land, God was their king. He miraculously saved them and fed them and led them. And after all that, he told them how to live. And Israel was like, we love you, God. We're going to live like that. And then they never lived like that. So trouble arises because consequences come and people come and, and wage war against the Israelites. And in the, instead of the Israelites thinking, man, it's really our fault that these consequences are befalling us, they say, oh, there must be something wrong with our king. God must be weak. He can't defend us. But inevitably, they plead for God to save them, and he does because God is faithful. And, okay, God, we're going to obey for a time, but then they don't. And Israel blames God again when consequences befall them. Israelites' trouble came from stubborn disobedience, not divine deficiency. And the ultimate act of trouble and disobedience came when Israel was like, hey, God, we're no longer okay with you being our king. We want a human king. We want to be like everyone else. And if we had a human king like everyone else, these things wouldn't happen. People wouldn't dare come invade our land because we, had a, we have a king. So God says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, be careful what you wish for. This king, this human king, he's going to lord over you. He's going to overtax you. He's going to steal your lands. He's going to draft your young men for his armies to fight his battles. You sure you want this? And Israel's like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So God's like, all right, fine. Be careful what you ask for. And God gave him, or God gave them, Saul. It's the first character in our narrative. Now, I've said this. Uh, hype students, who is a good representation of King Saul from the Marvel movies? You can say it. Thor? You guys remember this? Uh, Saul is, yes, you do. Shut, stop shaking your head. Uh, Saul is presented in 1 Samuel as tall, dark, and handsome. He's said to be a head taller than anyone else. My favorite way to think about Saul is like Chris Hemsworth as Thor. Yes, he's strong-willed and arrogant and stubborn, but in the minds of the people, he's presented as someone who knows how to get what he wants. He's the epitome of what a good king looks like. We want him. Here's a note about Saul. He is great by the world's standards. He's what the cultures around the Israelites had. And instead of finding their identity and peace and safety and security in God or Yahweh as their king, Israel found it or sought to find it in another, Saul. And Saul literally takes the place of God on the throne in Israel. Saul's name in Hebrew, get this, means asked for. Remember 1 Samuel 8, be careful what you ask for. Do you feel the stress here? I'm, I'm building towards something that's going to matter later as we read this narrative well. Um, and what happens? Saul sins. God says that I will rip the throne away from Saul. And what does God do then? He introduces us to another main character of our narrative, David, whose name means beloved. Uh, he is described as a ruddy youth with bright, beautiful eyes. Uh, I've said this before. A good way to think about David is Peter Pan. I'm serious. It's, it's going to help. 
uh, is Peter Pan, and uh, God anoints David privately. You will be king, and yet still, as our narrative unfolds, Saul is publicly on the throne. The main problem, Israel denies God as their king and finds their identity in another. So we jump into our text to look at more problems in verses 1 through 11. Read with me. Oh, silently. I've done that before and you guys read out loud. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephesh the Mean. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head and was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and, his ja uh, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So we have more problems. Um, this is the setting of our narrative. I'm going to try to do this. I, I'm going to get confused, so just stay with me. Your west would be here. Philistines are coming from the west. Right, is that right? This is west for you guys? Okay, thanks. It's going to get, I'm, I'm not dyslexic, but it's going to get in my head. Uh, the Philistines are raiding east from the west, and Israel, led by Saul, he does something good for once, comes west to fight the Philistines. There's a mountain here and a mountain here. Over here is the hill country of Judah. The Philistines want to raid into the hill country of Judah because they want a foothold into Israel. And Saul and the people of Israel draw a literal line in the sand between two mountains, the Valley of Elah, and this is where our uh, story, our narrative unfolds. In verses 4 through 7, we are introduced to our, uh, to our third main character. Goliath of Gath. Now, if Saul means asked for, David means beloved, uh, you probably want me to tell you what Goliath means. Um, the etymology of the, word, of the name Goliath is, is really uncertain. Many people think many different things. The three best I've found um, from the languages around Philistia at the time, Goliath could mean lion man, so a, a man of lion-like size and ferocity. Um, this is a, a very likely one. It could mean exposer. So not exposure like a camera, but exposer. There's like sexual undertones here because of the Philistines' desire to rape and raid the land of Israel. If it is exposer and there are sexual undertones here, um, spoiler alert, David chops off the head of uh, Goliath at the end, and we know that the Israelites were defined by circumcision, meaning they were going to cut away the impurity, and the Gentiles were defined by uncircumcision, meaning the purity had not yet, the impurity had not yet been cut away. So if it's exposure, there, exposure, there's some poetic justice that may happen at the very end. Another one, uh, it could mean exile or separation. So Goliath could even represent separation from God himself. In any event, Goliath represents the enemy. It's said that he is a champion which mean, literally means a man between two. So Goliath steps out as a champion representing Philistia and issues a challenge. Before we get to the challenge, here's a quick note. He's listed in your Bibles as six cubits and a span. That's like nine foot nine. 
uh, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Bible that Jesus used, um, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of the oldest copies of the Old Testament we have, list his height at four cubits in a span, so six foot nine. Um, I'll let you talk to Ralph Bass about do we trust the oldest manuscripts or do we trust the most pervasive manuscripts? Uh, he knows more than me about that. So uh, in any event, Goliath is a mountain of a man. He's a giant by the standards of the geographical location at the time because the fighters, the warriors of this time in 3000 BC were about five foot tall at the very tallest five six. I'm five eight, so like I wish I would live back then because I'm sick of being a short king. Like I, I wanna uh, go back there. Let's compare though, uh, six nine or nine foot nine is Goliath, this champion. Saul, a head taller than any of the warriors of Israel, so probably around six foot tall, tall himself. And then David, a ruddy youth, probably not even five feet tall yet. This is good to keep some perspective. In verses 8 through 11, Goliath issues a challenge. He demands mortal combat or single combat. Now, this is depicted in many movies and TV shows that I'm not going to uh, name drop here, but if you know what I'm talking about, single combat, um, it means I represent my people, and I want to fight one man who represents your people, and the winner of our duel to the death will symbolically triumph over the other. And Saul comes, or sorry, Goliath comes and issues this challenge. But notice, in these verses, who does he issue the challenge to? Servants of Saul. Up until like two minutes ago in Israelite history, they were always servants of the living God. There is a God in Israel. But the Israelites are so quick to forget their own identity and their identity throughout the cultures fades as well. These verses conclude with when Saul and all of Israel heard this. They were afraid and greatly dismayed. Again, perspective. Saul is Thor. Saul is the epitome of a fierce warrior king. And yet he is terrified and helpless. Let's think Israelite history. Yahweh defeated Pharaoh. Yahweh led the people through the wilderness. Yahweh helped the people purge the promised land. Yahweh sent representatives, but Yahweh got glory throughout the judges when Israel fought Philistines before. But now it's Saul's job as king. And Saul is terrified. I wonder if you see where we're going here. Yahweh has faithfully led and delivered the people of Israel for their whole life. And yet they constantly and cyclically place people and things and idols on their throne in spite of him. How often do we ask for things that are not good for us? How often do we ask for things that are not God's best for us? And when we really get what we ask for, How often do those things let us down? It could be time this morning to check your own heart and see what you have replaced God with, who or what is the king, and is it all you've ever asked for? We move on to more problems still in verses 12 through 30. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite in Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle, and the names of these three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephath of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. 
And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brother. And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. So uh, 12 through 23 is basically just um, a, a narrative device. David is being caught up with the rest of the plot. So the main events are happening at the Valley of Elah. David, one of our main characters is over here. He has to get here somehow. So uh, the biblical author tells us how and why David showed up. And, and that's basically the main point. Um, one quick note here. Saw, uh, Goliath is said to come out for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, what other numbers or what other things come to your mind when you think of 40 in the Bible? I'm looking at you, Jeremy Morton. Uh, the 40 days of the flood. Moses fasting for 40 days on the mountain with God. 40, yes, Jesus fasting for 40 days, the 40, day, 40 years of uh, wandering in the wilderness. 40 um, doesn't necessarily mean 40 literal days. The, the Bible uses the number 40 to symbolize an extended period of time, more often than not of trials and tribulation. So for an extended period of time, Israel had to listen to this man over and over and over again, mock and make fun of and defy Israel. That's what uh, has happened. Uh, verses 24 to 30 now. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away from the, uh, the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now, <clears throat> Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know the presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is it not but a word? And he turned away from him towards another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. Again, we see David joining the story. A note here, look how the Israelites themselves viewed Goliath's challenge. He has come up to defy Israel. This is personal. Two minutes ago, we were defending the Lord. Two minutes ago, we were God's people. But now we have Saul. Now it's us who he's attacking. We see David's shock at both who Israel thinks is being defied and the reward offered by Saul. Because David knows that this is not a personal attack against Israel, but this is an attack against the true king in Israel, God. So David's shocked that Saul even offers reward. God's true people, God's true followers, understand that our purpose for this life is to bring God glory, not ourselves. God's ultimate purpose for our lives is to glorify himself, not us. David is shocked at Saul's reward because Saul's reward is set up as a defense of himself. But David sees his duty is to stand for God. The question can be asked this morning, are we quick to defend ourselves when we're persecuted for our faith? Are we quick to give in to peer pressure and cowtail to the pressures around us? Or do we see it as our duty to stand on our convictions that our relationship with God is the most important thing? Verses 28 through 30, we see Eliab's slander. Much could be made about bad family advice. But uh, at this point, I'm, I'm sick of problems. We had the main problem. We had more problems. We had more problems still. I, I think it's time that we shift our focus to a solution. 
in verses 31 to 40. After all the problems, after David himself heard Goliath's challenge. Verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I can't go with these, for I've not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. So here is the solution. David says, I'll go kill him. Nobody else wants to? I'll go kill him. I think in every sermon I've preached here, um, at some point or another, I've referenced the Lord of the Rings. So to keep my streak alive, here we go. Um, what's happening here, if you think in the Fellowship of the Ring, the Council of Elrond, you have an undefeatable enemy. You have a bunch of war-hardened warriors too terrified to do anything. And then you have an unlikely, unremarkable hero standing up and saying, I'll do it. So Frodo takes the ring to Mordor. David, Peter Pan, says, I'll go fight Goliath. That was for free. (laughs) We get a glimpse here into David's character. He never shied away from his duty, no matter the odds. And this is a picture of biblical masculinity, the epitome of biblical manhood, of biblical priesthood. A note to my dads here in the congregation today. Not just my dad, but my dads collectively. Are you this quick to do your duty for your family? Are you this quick to defend them, no matter the odds? The spiritual warfare that ravages your wife and your children, are you this quick to wake up every morning and hit your knees in battle as your duty to defend your family? That's what David did. Are we this quick to do that? We see pictures into David's confidence. Why is he so confident? Uh, His confidence stemmed from what God had previously done in and through him. God was faithful to me in the past. God's going to be faithful to me now. And again, David makes mention of this uncircumcised Philistine whose head he's about to chop off. Contrast that with Saul's lack of confidence or confidence in the wrong thing. Because when David says, I'll go fight him, Saul says, you go ahead. Maybe the Lord will be with you. Because Saul has no confidence in himself and Saul has no confidence in the Lord. And then the wrong confidence is placed on David in Saul's armor. After all these problems, the solution is simple. Uh, I, David, am going to go kill this Philistine. No, not with conventional means of combat. I'm going to rely on the Lord's faithfulness to win this battle because it's not me who is being attacked here. It's the Lord, and the Lord will receive glory. And we come to the five smooth stones. Now remember, our Roman brother said that uh, we have five smooth stones to defeat the Goliaths of our lives. Well, that's not unique to Rome, Roman Catholic. That's not unique to Rome. Uh, A sermon preached by a big Eva, big evangelicalism, like a random non-denominational mega pastor, uh, preached it this way. Faith, trust, courage, obedience, and praise. And with these five smooth stones, we can overcome. A Mormon, faith, obedience, service, prayer, Holy Ghost. We can overcome. A Jew, a Hebrew, 
preaching on this text, an Orthodox Jew preaching on this text, says the five smooth stones represent the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So David relied on the word of God to defeat Goliath, which is better than anything we've heard so far. But we need to rely on the word of God to defeat the Goliaths of our life, which is terrible. Presbyterians, of course, shout out to Joe, know what the five smooth stones really stand for. Total depravity, unconditional election, <laughs> limited atonement. No, I'm just kidding. Joe, when I told Joe I wanted to preach this, he, was, he told me that right away. Uh, truthfully, I don't know if the smooth five stones have a significant allegorical meaning. Remember, sometimes a tent peg is just a tent peg. Sometimes smooth stones just mean smooth stones. But everybody else takes a shot at what these mean, so I'll give you my best two uh, ideas of what this means. Um, basically, David was being prepared in case he missed, which is smart. It can mean that. Uh, if it has to have some form of symbolic meaning, um, there's this thing called blood revenge during this time. Think Hatfields and McCoys. Um, I kill you. Uh, your dad kills me, my brother kills your dad, and then a civil war between Kentucky and West Virginia happened. Um, blood revenge. David chose five smooth stones. If we read 1 2 Kings, or, or sorry, 1 2 Samuel well, Goliath either had four sons or he had four brothers. In 2 Samuel chapter 21, we read that four other giants were killed at the hands of David and his men. So David chose five stones, uh, symbolically representing blood revenge. Hey, I'm going to end your whole bloodline. which is pretty metal. Uh, if it means that, that's great. I think it could. Uh, here's the point, though. It, it, it does not represent five smooth stones that we take on ourselves to defeat Goliath in our life. That's not how you read this story. So let's get to the conclusion to see how we read this story. Verses 41 through 51. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome, and looked like Peter Pan in appearance. <laughs> ruddy means red. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the fields. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and, and spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took Goliath's sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. It's the conclusion of our story. We see, again, the disparity of force. Goliath, a man of war from his youth, a fearsome, giant warrior, uh, ad arrayed in the trimmings of the best of the best of the time. Defying David and cursing David by his demonic gods. And we see David's indign uh, indignance here. Because, again, unlike Saul and Israel, 
David knew that the disdain was for Yahweh. It wasn't personal. So David's confidence was in Yahweh, not personal. We see the reason for God's deliverance here. That God might receive glory. God says to Israel, you asked for Saul. Saul has failed you. And yet, I am still here. I am still faithfully on the throne. I will deliver you faithfully like I promised. And I will receive the glory from this. You cannot rely on battles, or you cannot rely on your own strength to win battles. You can't rely on your own idols to win battles. You can't rely on five smooth stones, whatever they are, to win battles. The battle belongs to our God. And let's talk about that battle. Um, David's sling. Much could be said about the history of uh, slings as formidable distance weapons in this time, about 3000 BC. Um, a lot of extra biblical ancient texts, uh, specifically Greek and Roman texts, uh, show that slings uh, and sling practices had targets at 200 as far as 400 yards. Entire companies are depicted as outfitted with slings in battle. So slings are deadly and formidable, just like bow and arrows. It, it, it's not this like slingshot that you take to battle. It, it, it's a real weapon of war. But Goliath's disdain is that it's a poor man's weapon. He, he had no esteem for David. This was not the conventional weapon of a champion, a man between two, a representative of a people. Saul had the wealth of his entire nation on his back, pretty much literally. This is my Philistia versus your Israel, and all you have is a sling and a boy? And we see what happens. David, again, showing his character, sprints to the battle. He slings his stone. The projectile finds its mark, sinks into Goliath's forehead, knocks him out, and then David takes Goliath's own sword, adding insult to injury, and chops off Goliath's head. I've made some some somewhat crass parallels between decapitation and circumcision um, that, that is there in this text. It's, it's poetic. A, a better parallel, though, with David decapitating Goliath is Genesis 3.15. For what Goliath represents, which we'll get to short, shortly, what Goliath represents, Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel where God declares to Eve, your seed will crush the head of the enemy. And David cuts off the head after crushing it of Goliath. And that's our conclusion. Verses 52 to 58, uh, we're not going to read it this morning, talk about Israel's rout of the Philistines because they flee when they see Goliath fall and Israel uh, runs after them, uh, destroys them and, and raids their camp. Um, and then chapter 17 concludes with David um, being uh, asked about by Saul to uh, come into Saul's service, which will be all sorts of problematic in the coming chapters. So let's close this morning by reading this narrative well. We've got four questions. Who are we in the story of David and Goliath. Um, we're not David. And, and thank God for that. We're not the hero. We're not the Messiah. We're not the Christ. We're not the anointed. We don't take five stones to defeat our Goliaths. Who are we in the story of David and, and Goliath? We are Israel. We have a faithful God on our throne who we've rejected and we've placed idols on our heart, the throne of our heart. We put our faith in the idols instead of our faith in God. And when the enemy comes, we cower behind our idol thinking that that can save us. And guess what? It can't. We're not the hero of the story. 
We're not necessarily the villain, but, but we're not even a main character here. We are scared Israel who has abandoned God and we're hiding behind our idols. Who is Goliath? He's not the promotion at work. He's not that relation, uh, um, <clears throat> he's not the bullies at your school. He's not the state championship team that you have to defeat when you face your giants. Goliath is the enemy. He is exile. He is separation from God. He is sin. He is death. In a broader sense, he is Satan himself. We have no hope of victory over these things. In and of ourselves, we cannot defeat the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our enemy is real, and he is dangerous. And he poses a real threat. Who is Saul? Because of our very real enemy, we have made ourselves kings to help defend us. Who, who is Saul? Saul is that promotion at work. Saul is that relationship that you think you need to be happy. Saul's your iPhone. Saul is financial security. Saul is the success of your children. Saul is your social status. Whatever the world tells you you need to have in order to be happy and to be who you're meant to be. Saul is an idol that you look to and cling to to give you purpose. And it is a mute idol, defenseless and helpless to defend against the enemy. Saul represents, if I just get X, all my problems will go away. Saul is the things we ask for that fail us and leave us feeling empty. So friends, who is David? Thank God for this. David is not you. Don't get me wrong. You, you should seek to emulate some things about David. I, I addressed my dads in the audience and said, be like David. Um, you should. But that's not the thrust of this narrative. You shouldn't identify with David. It's not the main way to read this. In the framework of the narrative, hear me, David is an unremarkable hero who was despised by the enemy and who had no esteem. David was the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the king who was to come, who comes to the battleground itself, in the muck and the mire and the trenches to do what Israel could not, to do what Saul could not, rescue God's people. He defeats a seemingly undefeatable enemy in an, a, a weird way. He brings God the victory. He brings God the glory and will later establish his kingdom. In the framework of the story, David is a real historical figure who was used by God to really save God's people. In the framework of the Bible as a whole, he is a type and a shadow of Jesus himself, who, like David, was despised. We esteemed him not. And yet he is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the king who comes down to the battleground of earth, of humanity, enters into your muck and your mire in the trenches with you to live the life that you could not, to rescue God's true people. In his dying and in his rising, he defeats the ultimate enemy, sin and death, as only he could. He brings God glory in that victory and establishes his kingdom forever, friends, for which he is coming back one day. Do you know this king? Do you know this Messiah? I would love to introduce you if you don't. If you do, I, I hope you will glory and glorify him today. Would you pray with me?